you may get a message. All right, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm Andrea. Great to virtually meet everyone. I'm currently a PhD student, as Sarah just mentioned, at the University of Maine. Um, I'm a part of the School of Biology and Ecology and also the Climate Change Institute. Um, and you might have noticed my lab's fun logo with the mammoth on it, but I am associated with the BEAST Lab, which stands for Biodiversity and Environmental Change Across Space and Time. Very fancy and fun title we have, but I'm super excited to um, share some knowledge about alpine plants with you today, and in particular, Maine's alpine plants. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Um, I'm sure you are all very aware of the incredible extreme temperatures we experienced this past weekend. So I just wanted to mention how much more extreme those temperatures and wind chill was on the summits of some of New England's mountains. So on Katahdin, it was thought to be around negative 84 degrees with wind chill. Um, and then in our neighboring New Hampshire on Mount Washington, uh, there was a record broken um, for the lowest uh, wind chill ever recorded in the United States, which is pretty mind blowing. So this kind of just gives you a good idea of how um, well these plants can deal with these really, really extreme temperatures and how well adapted they are to these really extreme mountaintop environments. And um, this picture on the right here is just a summit photo of Katahdin during the winter time. And you can see just how windswept um, and frozen it is up there. Um, I have never hiked Katahdin in the winter and I'm not sure I plan to because of how extreme the weather, uh, winter weather can be. So I'll start out by just getting into what alpine plants are. I feel like when I talk to folks that aren't plant people. Um, it's not always clear what I mean by alpine plants. So when I say alpine plants, I'm talking about the herbs, shrubs, grasses, sedges, mosses, and lichens that grow above tree line and high mountain ecosystems. Um, and you might notice that that list does not contain any trees. Um, so that's kind of the defining factor here is that um, once we reach tree line and go above tree line, trees are not able to survive in these extreme habitats. And we are left with these kind of uh, low growing shrubs and herbs. Um, and uh, in Maine's case, a lot of the alpine species we have are also often found in the Arctic today. Um, so these plants would have what's called a circumboreal distribution. So that means they're growing across the globe um, in boreal and arctic habitats, so basically in a circle around the top of the globe, which is super, super cool. So you can um, imagine that some of the alpine species we have in Maine, which would be all the way down here, would also be found all the way across the top of the globe, so somewhere in Russia or in Arctic Canada, um, which is pretty neat. So man's alpine plants are very, very well adapted to those extreme conditions that I mentioned um, at these really high elevation sites. So some of the things that they're really well adapted to withstanding include really strong winds. This is a, a really big factor for um, where tree line exists on a mountain. So uh, a lot of trees can't withstand these same um, very strong winds. Extreme temperatures and precipitation. So a lot of alpine areas um, experience very, very low temperatures, um, as well as either a lot of snow or very little snow and rain. Um, and then they also experience very short growing seasons compared to places below tree line. Um, so in a forested ecosystem in Maine, you might consider the growing season being maybe somewhere from April to May to October to November, whereas in the alpine zone, that growing season is much shorter. Uh, so the growth of plant um, 
can do is kind of reduced um, within a season. And so these plants didn't always exist uh, just on the mountaintops in Maine. Um, so about 20-ish thousand years ago, much of New England was covered in an ice sheet known as the Laurentide Ice Sheet. And as climate changed, this ice sheet retreated and behind it left a lot of open or bare ground. Um, and that bare ground was first colonized by these Arctic, Arctic tundra species um, that we have um, in the Alpine zone today. And so as climate changed, these species were kind of pushed up um, by forest ecosystems to these really high elevation sites where they were able to survive. But it's really interesting to think about what Maine could have looked like thousands of years ago, um, dominated by a lot of Arctic tundra species. So a lot of the herbs and shrubs um, and more grass-like species. Um, and I really love this depiction of what it could have looked like below the ice sheet front um, with uh, the mammoths in the foreground. But I've been told by folks in my lab, this isn't you know, an entirely um, accurate depiction of what an ice sheet front would look like or a glacier front would look like. Um, but it does do a nice job of giving you an idea of how a lot of this land uh, just below the ice sheet is dominated by these low growing um, herbs and shrubs. And so today, uh, like I mentioned, these, these Arctic alpine species were pushed up to these really high elevation sites. Um, and now across Maine's mountains, we have uh, what is what ecologists might refer to as an elevational gradient of different natural community types. So if you start at the lowest elevations of the mountain, so around sea level, um, you would probably be in a mixed northern hardwood forest. So you'd see a lot of deciduous trees mixed in with some coniferous trees. So a lot of maples, beeches, birches. And then as you move up in elevation, it gets a little colder, conditions get a little different. Uh, and you would end up in a coniferous forest that is more dominated by things like spruce and balsam fir. And then we keep climbing the mountain. We end up in the subalpine or in the crummelts, which is basically the last extent to where these tree species can grow. So beyond the subalpine and the crummelts, it is too the conditions are too extreme for trees um, to be able to grow to normal heights. Um, and the word Krumholtz translates to knee pine in German. So it's literally referring to the fact that these trees are so stunted that they only grow as tall as your knees. Um, and so that's what we would refer to as the tree line, the area where trees are no longer able to grow. And once you're beyond that, you end up in the alpine zone, which in New England and Maine is usually somewhere around 4,000 feet above sea level. And so there are lots of discontinuous uh, patches of alpine habitat throughout the Northeast. So you can see in this map, uh, there's some larger chunks of alpine habitat in New York. So in the Adirondacks um, and also in New Hampshire in the White Mountains. And there's some smaller patches in Vermont in the Green Mountains. Um, and then also you can see where we have some alpine habitat in Maine. So in the Longfellow ranges, um, and then all, obviously also around Katahdin. And then we also have this pretty far away uh, patch of alpine habitat in Quebec. Um, and so some places to visit and some places I've done a lot of field work and really loved. Um, We'll start with Bigelow. So on Avery Peak um, of the Bigelows, there is a relatively small uh, amount of alpine habitat, but it's still a really remarkable place to visit. It's a really fun hike. Um, I think it might be a little bit easier of a hike than some of the other uh, 
places that have done field work, um, but it's a really amazing place to visit if you wanna see some alpine species. Mount Abraham is the second largest alpine zone in Maine, and it's another really beautiful place to visit. The hike, I think, is a little bit harder than Bigelow, in my opinion, um, because it just feels like you're climbing kind of straight upwards the whole time. But it is really beautiful, um, would recommend. And then obviously Katahdin is the largest continuous alpine zone in Maine. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can get to the summit on Katahdin. Um, and obviously it's a very, very beautiful place to visit. There are also a couple other smaller patches of alpine habitat throughout the state. So if you went to the North or South Brothers, you would see some alpine habitat and then also Saddleback Mountain and a few others um, that have a little bit smaller of an alpine zone. And so of course, now that I've told you where you can go and see these plants, I have to mention how fragile they are um, when it comes to uh, footsteps. So they may be very resilient under these extreme climate conditions, but they're not very resilient under your feet. Um, so it's always important to stay on trail when you're visiting alpine habitats and not to pick or disturb any of the vegetation. Um, I really love collecting photos of um, rare plant community signs that uh, depict um, how you should stay on trail. And this is one of my favorites on the right um, from White Mountain National Forest. Help preserve the delicate balance of the alpine zone. It's a tough place to grow. Um, I always really liked that sign. And then of course, I love this button. Don't be a tundra stomper, stay on trails. So I wanted to share with you some of my favorite alpine species that you can find uh, throughout Maine uh, in Maine's alpine zones. Um, first, I'm gonna start out by sharing some of what I would refer to as alpine specialists. So these are species that only occur in the alpine zone. So they're only occurring above tree line. This would exclude some uh, species that occur in other types of habitats that I'll get to later. Um, but here's just a, a small selection of some of my favorite of man's alpine plants. So first, and probably everyone's favorite, if you've if you've been to any of Maine's alpine zones, it's probably also my favorite is Diapensia laponica. Um, it's this really adorable cushion plant um, that grows above tree line. This video is from Mount Abraham. There is a lot of Diapensia on Mount Abraham, um, but it's got some really amazing adaptations that allow it to live in incredibly harsh environments. So it has this cushion form to it, as you can see in this video thumbnail. I'll play it again just because it's fun. Um, but yeah, that cushion form allows it to be really resilient against wind. So this species is often found in areas of the alpine zone that are really wind blown and where a lot of other species wouldn't be able to survive. Um, and so it is able to keep itself warm in a way. So the center of that cushion has been found to be able to be eight degrees warmer than ambient air temperatures, um, which is why it's able to do so well in such windy and extreme conditions. It's just a really cool plant. Um, it has these really adorable white flowers. It usually blooms, I think, early, mid June. Um, and then sometimes it also blooms a second time later in the season, which is really interesting. Um, but yeah, if you see these matte like, or kind of globular masses of, of leaves, you'll know you're looking at Diapensia laponica. It doesn't really have a common name. I think the common name is just Diapensia, but it's a favorite. And let's see. OK, 
Okay, so next we have alpine blueberry or alpine bilberry. The scientific name is Vicinium ulinginosum. Um, so it's in the blueberry family. You can eat the berries, but I wouldn't recommend it. They're not as delicious as low bush blueberry. And I can't recommend you picking anything in the alpine zone anyway. So just know that you could if you had to. Um, and so this photo on the right is from Bigelow Avery Peak during one of our surveys. And you can see all of this kind of reddish brown bushy looking vegetation is all alpine blueberry. Um, so it's really prolific. It grows, uh, it kind of takes over some areas of the alpine zone. Um, so you'll definitely see it if you hike any of Maine's um, peaks that have an alpine zone, you will probably see this plant all over. Um, and it has really, really adorable little pinkish flowers. Um, and it often, as I mentioned, kind of takes over areas. So I'll go back to the diapensia slide. You can actually see a lot of alpine blueberry in growing kind of within the diapensia cushion here. So any of these little pink flowers growing around the diapensia are um, alpine blueberry. Uh, another plant that I love, Bigelow's sedge. Um, it's in the sedge family, so it might look like a grass, but it is different from a grass. This here in this photo is the inflorescence or the flowers. Um, so that would be releasing pollen in the spring and summer um, when the flowers kind of open. Um, and this is a really pretty common one across Maine's alpine zones. If you're ever in an area that looks like it's very meadow-like um, and it looks like there might be a lot of grass around you, it's most likely an area dominated by Bigelow sedge. Um, so as you can see in this photo, this is um, on Pomola on Katahdin. Um, this area is kind of dominated by a lot of Bigelow sedge and then there's also some alpine blueberry in there too um, growing around the Bigelow sedge. Another one, Highland Rush. This is another species that does look very grass-like, but is not a grass. It's in the Rush family. Um, it has this kind of reddish brown top to it. Um, as you can see in this photo on the right, that is also from Katahdin. And it grows in these really kind of dense and large tufts, um, which is pretty interesting. And again, it does really well in the wind. So you'll see, uh, this species uh, in very windy, windswept areas of the alpine zone, kind of growing amongst diapensia um, and also alpine blueberry. So in this photo, I can see there's a lot of diapensia cushions growing around in the same habitat as these highland rush individuals. Another one, this actually is rivaling my favorite. Um, this might be a little higher on my list than diapensia, but Arctic bearberry, um, also in the blueberry family. You might notice a pattern. There are a lot of blueberry family members that grow in the alpine zone, but this one is very cool. It is very rare in Maine. It only grows on Katahdin and in some places in New Hampshire, in the White Mountains. Um, and has these really, really beautiful leaves um, that turn a really bright, bright red in the fall. So I always think of it as kind of like Katahdin's alpine fall foliage because it turns this really brilliant red. Um, and it also has this kind of almost snake skin like veination on its leaves, which makes it really unique looking. And it again grows in a very similar habitat type to. Um, diapensia and Highland Rush. So this, um, this uh, survey location, uh, it was an area we found some Arctic bearberry and you can see there's some Highland Rush uh, tufts growing along here and also a lot of diapensia. So again, this plant is really, really hardy when it comes to growing in really wind swept areas. Um, and it's also another species that is circumboreal. So you will find this species in the actual Arctic. 
which is very cool. I love this plant. Um, this is Alpine azalea, which again is in the blueberry family. Um, it's in the genus Calmia, which is actually the same genus as um, mountain laurel, which is pretty cool. Um, although it's much, much, much smaller than mountain laurel. Um, it has these very succulent, very small leaves. So the leaves are pretty thick. Um, as you can imagine, that's a really good adaptation to have in high stress, cold environments is having these really thick leaves that are able to be protected from winds and ice and snow. Um, it has these really gorgeous pink flowers in the spring. And it's also, so when you're doing alpine surveys and identifying all of these plants, it's really hard to miss this one because the leaves are so small and it often blends in really well with diapensia leaves. So the leaves are pretty similar. So when you're doing surveys, you have to be really careful not to miss this plant. Um, but it is a very special plant, again, pretty rare. It only grows on Katahdin in Maine and then in a few sites in the White Mountains as well. Um, but it is a gorgeous, tiny, tiny little plant. This uh, birch, this shrubby birch species is actually a new one to me. Uh, I think I found this plant this past year in, on Katahdin, um, but it's called the glandular birch. Um, again, it's in the birch family and it's not technically a tree, it is because it is growing in the alpine zone, it is very shrubby. It is kind of still pretty low growing. Um, and it has these really tiny, adorable birch leaves. Um, as you can see, um, they're pretty small in the palm of my hand. And this is one that I found um, not very frequently, but um, it grows along some trails um, in some areas of Katahdin. Um, so you might run into it if you're up there hiking. Um, you, won't, you wouldn't have to go very far um, to see this guy. Um, and again, it is also rare, only on Katahdin and some sites in the White Mountains. And again, it is circumboreal. So this is another one you would find in the Arctic. Bearberry willow. Uh, this is an awesome plant. It looks a lot like um, the alpine bearberry or the arctic bearberry, but it is different. This is in the willow family, not the blueberry family. So this technically is another low growing shrub and you can see that it is still pretty woody. So these woody branches belong to this willow shrub. Um, it also has really beautiful veins in its leaves, really defined veins and beautiful willow flowers. Um, and this is another one uh, that you would find on Katahdin and also in the Arctic. And then, so the last uh, alpine specialist that I will share with you is mountain sand plant. Um, this plant is in the carnation family, which I think is pretty funny. Diapensia actually also used to be in the carnation family, but botanists love to disagree about what plant families certain plants should be in. So it was removed from the carnation family, but mountain sand plant is still in the carnation family. Um, it really likes very disturbed gravelly areas. So you'll often see it growing along trails in the alpine zone. So you'll probably see it. Um, if you're hiking, you'll see it all over. Um, and it flowers pretty prolifically as well. So um, you, if you're hiking in the summer, you probably will see it in flower and it's got these really gorgeous white flowers. It does look similar to diapensia in these photos because of the flowers, but the leaves look very, very different and they don't grow in that dense matte cushion-like form. So you'll be able to tell them apart. Um, but this is another one you will definitely see if you're hiking in Maine's Alpine Zone. And then, so I mentioned earlier the distinction between Alpine specialists, and then there's also some species that grow in the Alpine Zone, but are not 
true alpine specialists in that they also grow in lower elevations in different kinds of habitats. They just happen to be really hardy. Um, so some of these species include low bush blueberry. So this is Vicinium angustifolium. We would often find that in the alpine zone. So the real blueberries that you do want to eat, but you shouldn't. Um, Labrador tea is another one that's really common in the alpine zone and also sometimes grows in the subalpine zone. So still where there's some trees. This species you would find in a lot of boggy areas throughout Maine. So like the Orono bog has a lot of Labrador tea, but you would also find it up on Katahdin, which is really cool. Um, some cranberry species. So this is Vicinium vitus idea is another one that you would find growing um, in some bogs of Maine, but also in the Alpine zone. And then we have Canada Mayflower here um, and bunchberry down here. These are two species that I've often seen growing in the Alpine zone that you will see very, very commonly across the forest floor in Maine, especially um, <clears throat> Myanthemum canadense, which is the Canada Mayflower, I feel like is just so, so everywhere on the forest floor, um, but it's really interesting that it can also survive above tree line. And so a really interesting thing about the alpine zones of Maine and just alpine zones in general is that these different microclimates promote a diversity of different plant communities. So on the right here, we have what would be known as a diapensia heath meadow. So the plants that are growing in this alpine community type would be things like diapensia, the alpine blueberry, um, the bigelow sedge. Um, and these communities do really well with, like I mentioned, harsh winter winds with little to no snowpack. So the wind is just blowing off all of the snow that lands in these communities. And these plants are just really, really well adapted to dealing with that harsh environment. Whereas there's also areas of the alpine zone um, that require some insulating snow in the winter and some protection from harsh winds. And in these areas, we might see more of those lower elevation plants kind of creeping up into the al alpine zone. So in here, you can see some bunchberry um, and some low bush blueberry and even some ferns. Um, and this photo was taken um, above tree line in the alpine zone, but that just speaks to how important different climate conditions can be for promoting a diversity of habitat types, even in a singular mountaintop. And so I love this kind of um, image that it, it does a great job, job of explaining how different um, weather patterns or climate features um, impact what plants grow in the alpine zone. So if you can see, this uh, side of the triangle is wind. So we're going from uh, very exposed windy places to very protected, not so windy places. And then this side of the triangle is atmospheric moisture. So we go from very clear up into very heavy fog. And then this side of the triangle is snow. So this would be snow free down here. And this would be snow accumulation up here. And you can see in a very exposed, windy and snow-free habitat, we would end up with a lot of diapensia. So a lot of plants that are very well adapted to that high wind. Whereas if we move across the triangle, we end up in an area that's still a little bit windy, but there's a lot more snow accumulation. That's what we would call an alpine snow bank or snow bed community, um, like this photo here. Um, so those plants uh, depend more on protection from wind and insulation from snow in the winter time. But yeah, I've always loved this image. It does a really good job of um, kind of bringing it to the front of your mind how important different climate variables are for the presence of different alpine plant species. And so I'll get into a little bit about the research that I do um, 
in particular in Katahdin's alpine zone. So uh, about, I think it was 33 years ago, 1989, um, two botanists did a baseline survey of Katahdin's alpine zone because it had never been done before. Um, so they basically went up into the alpine zone, um, marked these different survey locations and recorded all the plants they saw and how much coverage they take up, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, basically to showcase to Baxter State Park what is up there, um, and which is really important for um, understanding how these plant communities could have changed through time in the face of climate change. Um, so this map here on the left are the different uh, uh, survey sites that we revisited in 2021 and 2022. Um, so we were able to find and repeat these same surveys that were done 33 years prior, which is super awesome um, and really, really important for climate change research. And that's what we would call long-term monitoring. And so when we do these surveys, this is kind of how it goes down. We usually use a um, quadrat, uh, which is basically just a big frame. Um, our quadrats are one meter by one meter. So it's just a big square that we throw, throw down to estimate how much area a plant is taking up. Um, so if you're ever hiking in the Alpine zone or anywhere and you see someone carrying around PVC pipes or just a big frame, just know that they're probably a botanist and they're probably doing plant surveys. Um, so when we put this um, quadrat down, what we're doing is estimating how much of that one meter is taken up by different plant species and also different substrates. And the kind of rule of thumb with this kind of survey is that 1% of your one meter squared quadrat is about the size of your palm. Um, so that's how we go about estimating how much space a plant is taking up. So in this particular example, you might estimate that diapensia, which is this plant right here, is taking up maybe about 40% of the quadrat, whereas rock is taking up about 60%. And these kind of surveys are really important for understanding how a plant community has changed through time. So we would know that if the diapensia was doing really well and, and flourishing, maybe over 33 years, the diapensia would be taking up more space in, the same, in this same plot uh, than it was 33 years prior. Um, so we can see how the community is changing through time. And we can also um, see how uh, the presence of different plants may be changing through time. So if there is a species that is no longer in that survey area, that plant may have been become extirpated or locally extinct, or it's just under too much stress um, and has kind of retreated. And so this is just an example of uh, one of our survey locations on Katahdin. So in order to find these same surveys locations that were done in 1989, we used these photos that were taken by the original surveyors as well as some location descriptions. But as you can imagine, it was incredibly difficult to find these spots to do these surveys because of um, these photos. Obviously we couldn't have done it without the photos, but it was still relatively difficult. So our hope is that um, with these updated surveys, we were able to make it easier for uh, future botanists to be able to find these same sites and repeat the surveys. So we marked each of these sites with really, really accurate GPS and updated uh, photos um, so that they'll be repeatable in the future. But so yeah, again, this is from 1989. This is one of our survey sites from 2021. And here is another one of our uh, comparisons. So again, 1989 film photo on Katahdin. And then on the left here, we have the 2021 version. And you can see that um, some of the Krumholtz here has actually grown taller. So this is kind of an area where 
um, trees were able to grow. So that's what we would call crumholtz. Um, and in the older photo, you can see some rocks behind these really stunted trees. And in the newer photo, we don't get that, that same image. We don't have those same rocks. So we're thinking that the Krumholtz actually was able to grow a little bit taller in this area over that 33 year period. And so as climate change and also increased hiker visitation threatens some of Maine's alpine plants, these plants have a few options um, as they do um, in other ecosystems. Plants that are under stress from climate change or human disturbance can adapt to their new conditions. They can become extirpated, which basically means locally extinct or they can track new, more favorable conditions or basically move um, to a new habitat. So what's, what's very different about New England and Maine's alpine areas is that we don't have what's called a nivel zone. So in a lot of alpine areas around the globe, there is a place above the alpine zone or a place of permanent or um, a place where snow sticks around for a lot longer. Um, so as climate changes in these areas and the snow begins to melt, the alpine plants below could theoretically colonize that new ground at higher elevations and track those temperatures that they really like. But again, what's different about New England and Maine's alpine areas is that we don't have this. We don't have this, uh, higher elevation place for alpine plants to move to. So when these plants are under stress because of warming temperatures and also possibly tree lines moving up the side of the mountain with those warming temperatures, there's no new place for the alpine plants to go. Um, so that third option is kind of taken out of the equation, which is why it's so, so important to do the surveys that myself and other folks are doing so we can see how these plants have already been able to adapt or have not been able to adapt through time um, so that we can better prepare for the future and better conserve these plants in the future. Um, there are a lot of benefits to long-term monitoring, especially in rare plant communities like in the alpine zone. And of course, I have to touch on how sometimes the weather in the alpine zone cooperates and you get a beautiful sunny day and you get a nice sunburn or a tan, and then sometimes it does not. So I, as someone who spent, you know, eight hours on the summit of some of these mountains every day for many weeks, um, I would caution folks who plan to hike any of these places um, that you should stay up to date about what the weather is like um, and always plan for the weather that you don't expect basically. Um, so it's often raining, it's often foggy, it's often really, really cold, even if it's the middle of the summertime. Um, so just be prepared when you're entering the Alpine zone for that unpredictable weather um, to occur. So I always had a raincoat, no matter what. But again, I was also up there for a long time. So it would get very, very bone chillingly cold, even in the middle of July. And I wanted to provide some recommendations too, if you're interested in Maine and beyond alpine plants. Um, so first on the left here, we have Forest and Crag. This is a really great book. It's super long. It's like, I don't know, 400 pages. It's a very thick book um, about the history of hiking, trailblazing, and adventure in the Northeast Mountains. There is a decent chunk of the book that is about Katahdin and some other mountains in Maine. Um, it's a great read. It's also just a great reference if you don't want to read through the whole really long book all at once. Um, and then uh, over here on the right is another kind of similar book about um, explorations and hiking on Katahdin. I just started reading this book, so I don't have a full, you know, uh, 
review of it for you yet, but so far it's very good. And it's more on the end of if you're interested in um, like hiking and adventure in Maine's mountains, um, this would be a good one to look into. Now, if you're more interested on the plant side and you want to be able to identify some plants and learn about their adaptations, I have these three books and then a website to share with you. So The Plants of Baxter State Park is a really great book with really great photographs of plants. It's also very thick, so I wouldn't recommend bringing it into the field with you to identify things, but it's a great reference book. It does include most, if not all, of the alpine plants you would encounter on Katahdin and in other places in Maine, but it also includes a lot of the lower elevation forest species. Um, then we have the Field Guide to New England Alpine Summits. This book is really is nice and thin. It's a great book to throw on your backpack and take on a hike with you. It's also not limited to just plants. There's birds, insects, what have you that you might find um, on New England's Alpine Summits, and it's done by the Appalachian Mountain Club. So it's a really great book. Um, and then here we have Alpine Plant Life which is more if you're interested in like the adaptations of why these plants are able to survive the conditions that they do. Um, that book is uh, really great to look into more of the sciencey side of alpine plant life across the globe. So it's not just limited to Maine or New England. And then if you don't wanna spend money on a book but you want to learn more about plants, I highly recommend the Go Botany. Native Plant Trust website is really great for learning to identify plants and it will have all of the New England alpine species that you would want to be identifying. So those are my recommendations. I'll leave that there for like two more seconds in case you want to take a picture of it or something. Um, but yeah, so that is my presentation. Thanks so much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, guys, uh, Andrew, that was great. Make sure you ask questions. I did just put the link to that um, Go Botany website in the chat so you can see too. And I'll um, I'll put the scavenger hunt password in there soon. But yeah, that was great. Thank you for sharing. Okay, and I did have one question in the chat earlier. Um, I'll just uh, go ahead and say it. Um, so somebody had asked about... Um, how much of a challenge it was obviously to look at the old pictures and and find the sites and if you had to take gps locations for those sites yeah it was it was very challenging and i definitely would not have been able to do it if it weren't for the fact that the person who originally did the surveys hiked all the way up there with us his name is don he's in this picture here he hiked all the way up there with us and helped us relocate them if he wasn't there to help, I'm not sure if we would have found them. It was very difficult um, just based on photos. And because in 1989, they didn't have the ease of taking a GPS up there with them, we didn't have GPS points um, in order to relocate them, but now we do. So now we, we brought what's called a differential GPS, which is basically just a GPS with centimeter level accuracy, which is really, really accurate um, in order to mark them so that future surveyors can go back to these same exact spots um, and redo the same surveys, which is really, really important and really awesome. And I was really, really happy to be a part of that research. Awesome. And there was um, a question from Liz. She had her hand up. And then there's a few more questions in the chat too, but uh, I'll let Liz ask hers. I think you can unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. Awesome presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask about the, the cushion plants. So in addition to the alpine blueberries, are there other plants that kind of grow within these cushion plants? And could this be due because of their like warming qualities? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's such an awesome question. I was actually reading a paper today that has to do with this question. So I definitely think there's something 
there. Um, there are a lot of other species that kind of grow within the cushion. Um, and there's kind of, there's this process known as facilitation, which basically means instead of plants competing, sometimes they kind of help each other out. Um, so it's thought that in environments that are very stressful, there's a lot of facilitation going on between uh, individuals within a plant community. So it's possible that these cushion species like diapensia are facilitating the growth of other species um, because yeah, they have that kind of warming thing going on. Um, so they allow other plants to kind of take advantage of that, which is pretty cool. But yeah, anytime uh, there's tons and tons of diapensia cushions where there's just like a ton of other species kind of poking up through the cushion, but it's a very cool, very cool question. Yeah, that's neat. And we have um, a couple questions in the chat. So one from Jeannie is, what did you find most rewarding and most challenging about your work up there? That's a good one. Great question. <laughs> um, it was definitely incredibly challenging. So um, we didn't just do surveys in Maine. So we actually were doing a lot of the same surveys in New Hampshire and Vermont. So there was a lot of travel, a lot of camping, a lot of climbing, a lot of knee pain, um, a lot of dealing with the elements. I'd say the most challenging part of all of the field work is dealing with the elements and the weather and just being on a mountain summit for eight plus hours in a day is incredibly mentally challenging and physically challenging. Um, but yeah, it's also incredibly rewarding to think about the fact that we were able to complete these surveys and now they can be repeated in Baxter State Park and in other places we'll have a better idea of how climate change might impact these really rare plants, which to me is very important because I'm a plant person. So I think it was all very rewarding, but it was, it was definitely tough. Awesome. And we have another interesting one. Um, so has any researchers attempted to grow alpine plants in a controlled environment? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm not entirely sure if they've tried growing them in like a greenhouse environment, but there have been particular um, studies where I think it was actually diapensia, where researchers would take um, alpine species like diapensia and plant them below tree line just to see how they did, and they did not survive at all. And I'm pretty sure there was a particular study with with diapensia um, where they did that and it it did not work out for the diapensia so yeah they're very a lot of the what I call alpine specialists are very much specialized to that alpine environment in that they're they're just not going to grow below tree line very good question though it would be I'm I'm not quite sure if I'm sure someone along the line has tried to grow some alpine species in a greenhouse environment, but it would be really interesting to, to look into that. Awesome. We don't have any more questions in the chat, um, but if you have questions, you can um, raise your hand or just unmute yourself and say it, um, or you can go ahead and put it in the chat. So I'll, we have a few more minutes for questions. And Andrea, actually, I had a question. Um, it was, I find just the fact of, you know, there's no trees in the Alpine zone. And I was just wondering if you know about the specific adaptations that the Alpine plants have that they can withstand those extreme elements up there and grow in those unfavorable conditions. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so one that comes to mind and that 
uh, is shared by a lot of the species that I mentioned is the fact that they have these really kind of succulent, um, thick leaves, which makes them able to withstand harsher winds. And they have a thick, what's called a cuticle, which is basically just like the outer layer of that leaf is really, really strong. So it won't be penetrated by wind or scouring ice um, in the winter time. Another adaptation that a lot of the plants or some of the plants that I mentioned have is kind of like a, a shorter life cycle or lifespan. So things like the Highland Rush and the Bigelow Sedge are either annuals or biannuals. So they're not um, having to deal with the like harsh winter um, in the same way that some of the like cushion species are, which is why they're able to have like the kind of more delicate grass-like leaves. Um, so they're dependent on um, producing seeds and putting out seeds every year um, instead of withstanding uh, the harsh winter weather. But yeah, those are, those are two big ones right off the top of my head. Just having those really, really thick leaves that are able to withstand winter weather and then also a different kind of life history. Um, but yeah. Fantastic. Does anybody else have questions for Andrea? I don't know if you can hear my dog snoring in the background, but I'm very sorry. <laughs> nice. My dog snores too, so. <laughs> uh, okay, so we did have, um, somebody just said, thank you, Andrea. What a great introduction to the New England alpine flora and what your survey is monitoring. Hopefully we can hike this summer. So just some good words of encouragement for you. Nice. Uh, yeah. I think that's great. Well, I'll, I'll stay on for a few more minutes. Um, if anybody else does think of anything um, or send me an email. But thank you everyone for attending. Um, this was our, like I said, the first of our natural curious series. And we do have another one um, on mushrooms in two weeks. And then one um, the last Tuesday of the month, um, as well on uh, avian haven and bird rehabilitation, which should be really interesting. Um, so feel free to join in for those as well. And if you have any feedback for us about these events or maybe something you'd like us to do, um, maybe in March or after, um, we'd appreciate your feedback. Uh, thank you for sharing your contact information, Andrea, and for this whole presentation. It was great. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Anytime. Yeah, very interesting. I appreciated it all. <laughs> It made me uh, excited for summer. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And I am definitely going to be looking more closely at the plants when I hike mountains now. So I think that's great. All right. I think we've lost most of our participants. So I'll go ahead and, and let you go for the night. Cool. Thank you again. I really appreciate this. This was awesome. Yeah, of course. It was a lot of fun. I had fun oh. putting it together. Oh, good. Good, good. All right. Well, have a good night. Awesome. I'm going to end the meeting now. See you later, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.